Peace, everybody. How is everybody doing? So I have an interesting topic that I'm going to be going through today. And today I'm going to be talking about Liberia's early founding history. And we'll be going and we'll be doing this through a journal of Jehudi Ashman, somebody who went to Liberia when it was founded. Before I begin, make sure you like, share, and subscribe. Make sure you comment down below, tell us what you think, and of course, make sure you sign up to the website at bilafricstand.org slash register, okay? I just want to make sure that we do that before I fully get in depth. So I'm going to give people two or three minutes to get in, and then I'm going to jump in because there's a lot to talk about. Are you currently in Liberia? No, I'm not in Liberia at the moment, but I will be going to Liberia next year for sure. So make sure you check in for that because I'm going to be going there soon and I got a lot of stuff planned. So I'm excited about that. But right now, no, I'm not in, in Liberia at the moment. So we're going to get started. And again, this is the founding of Liberia's early history. We're going to be going through the journal of Jehudi Ashmoon. Now, who is Jehudi Ashmoon? Jehudi Ashmoon was a religious leader that played an instrumental role in helping establish Liberia and getting things going. And during his time in Liberia, he had a journal that he was collecting information about what was going on at the time. And this is very important. Because I'm going to break down the differences between primary, secondary, and tertiary sources. And I'm also going to break down how to construct history. Because that is important because a lot of people don't know how to accurately construct history. Give me one second real quick.
So this is going to be a lot. So I highly suggest you have everything prepared. If you want to take notes, make sure you have a notebook, make sure you have a pen and paper, or if you use Microsoft OneNote, you're going to need it because there's a lot of information I'm going to go into. Okay. So Jehudi Ashmoon's book is called, let me, share my, let me share my screen with you real quick so everybody knows. Um, give me one moment. It's titled American History, the, the History of the American Colony in Liberia, 1821 to 1823. And again, it's written by Jehudi Eshma. So that is what it is called. It is the History of the American Colony in Liberia, 1821 to 1823. You can get this book online. There are plenty of places where you can download it. You can read the entire thing for yourself. It is only about 40 pages it's not a lot you can easily go through it quickly if you so want to but that is where you can get the information Excuse me. I hope there's more people to come into the chat. I hope it's not just two people. Yeah. All right. So I have a lot of information. So the very first thing that I have is understanding history and how to construct it. This is this is very important. Because I think oftentimes when we look at history, we're not really constructing history in, a, in an appropriate manner. Instead, we are constructing history through the lens of what mainstream society has taught us, what mainstream society has given us information about, basically what's been regurgitated. So it's important for me to break down how to construct history, what to look for when you need to construct history, and therefore you're able to go do it for yourself. Here and also in the BIO, I don't want to just give you information. Yes, it's important for me to give you information, educate you, give you access to information you may not know about, but it's important that you understand how to discern information, important how to distinguish what sources are accurate, what sources are not accurate. Make sure you are able to distinguish or differentiate primary, secondary, and tertiary sources, because oftentimes when we look through history, we're looking through history through the lens of secondary and tertiary sources we're not looking through the lens of primary sources so it's important for me to distinguish that so understanding history like i said the way history is talked about is through a narrative that narrative is often created through mainstream efforts mainstream efforts oftentimes gloss over key information when doing research on a topic it is important that you look at primary sources and not secondary and tertiary sources. Everybody can see everything. So what is a primary source? Because we were like, what, 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 what is a primary source? What is that? Okay. So a primary source is a source that actually occurred at the time. This is not something that happened in the past or something that is being rewritten. A primary source is something that happened during the time. It is a first hand account of people who directly participated in it. Excuse me.
He's underrated. I just had to get a few things there. Um, we should be good to go now. I just had some things I had to get done. So, yeah. So, all right. So, like I said, this is what we're going through. I want to really break things down so people understand what is required, so people understand what is going on. So, what is a primary source? Immediate firsthand connections and accounts of people who had direct involvement. Secondary sources are information written by someone who did not experience the events firsthand or participated in them. And tertiary sources are indexed, abstract, organized, compile other sources. Okay, that's what you need to know. Now, examples of a primary source. Primary sources include scholarly journals, diaries, interviews, autobiographies, letters, government reports, proceedings. What is examples of secondary sources? Textbooks, biographies, literary criticisms, and interpretation, and edited works. Tertiary sources are encyclopedias, which I spelled encyclopedia wrong, almanacs, bibliographies, manuals, guidebooks. These are very important of what you need to look for when you're trying to construct history, when you're trying to do research. You need to know what is primary source, secondary source, tertiary source, and understand what each of them comprise of. Because what we're going off is a primary source off of Jehudi Ashmoon. Okay. So we're going to be talking about the first settlement. Now, some background information on Liberia before this occurs. So before African-Americans get there, Liberia does not exist. It is a compilation of different societies, kingdoms, clans, and ethnic groups. Okay. And so during that time, there was it was known as the Windward Coast, and there was a slave trade that was going on during that time. This was recorded as far back as in the 16 to 1700s, and it was documented with observations in 1807. That is where King Botswain comes into play. I'm going to be doing a separate one on those observations, but that is background information. Again, I'm trying to teach you how to piece and construct history. So I told you that history is given through mainstream narratives. I'm giving you primary, secondary, and tertiary sources so you're able to distinct, so you know how to put things together. Now I'm giving you the background information on the territory that, that will be called Liberia. That is the Windward Coast. Some people call it the Pepper Coast that comprises different kingdoms, ethnic groups, clans, confederations that are living in that region. Some are waging war against each other. Some have an alliance with each other. Some have unified. Some are having a slave trade that's going on as with King Baswain and others and other ethnic groups that were selling their people into slavery. The Pele's, for example, also the Grebos that were participating in the slave trade. So this is what is going on in the background. So, Jehudi Ashman talks about the first settlement. So the territory of the first settlement for the repatriates of Liberia has been made, may be seen to the present, the form of a narrow tongue of 12 leagues distance detached from the mainland. Okay, this is the excerpt. This is the very beginning. It is it's a narrow isthmus, basically meaning that this is a narrow piece of land at the mouth of the Monserrato and Junk Rivers and Cape Monserrato is the northwest termination of this uh, of a linear track as, as described by Ashmoon, which towards extremity rises to promontory sufficient majestic present a bold distinction from the uniform coast so this is a very rugged coast this is not a very uniform coastline so that is important for people to distinguish and towards the southeast it terminates to the mouth of the junk river so that is Cape Monserrato. It is a track of land that rises as you get to the coast, and then towards the southeast is where it terminates. It just goes to where the Junk River is, giving you a background of what Cape Monserrato is, that first settlement. Okay, It is situated on the inland peninsula. 
It forms the southwest bank of the river, Montserrat, about two miles within the extremity of the Cape. The original settlement approached 150, within 150 yards of the water, and it occupied the highest spinal ridge, traversed a large part of the peninsula, and it rises about a place above 75 feet. So I know this is a lot of language. I know the language that they use is very detailed. It's very, some of the vocabulary you may not understand. This settlement is basically on the coastline. It's not too far from the coast. And it's within two rivers that, that you need to know about. Okay. It, it, it's very, this is what Monrovia is. This is how they describe Monrovia. Okay. It's in the highest part. It is in the peninsula. And you can look on a map. I, I highly suggest you look at a map. Uh, matter of fact, let me give y'all a map right now so that y'all understand what we're talking about in terms of the geography uh, uh, of Liberia in the 1820s, okay? Because it, it might be very confusing to people who don't, have not seen a map of Cape Monserrato, okay? So this is Cape Monserrato or an image of Cape Monserrato in the 1820s. I need to give y'all a understanding, a picture of of the site. So this is the area of Cape Monserrato. Okay, that is the territory, so that people understand where we're talking about and what they're describing. Because, like I said, the, a lot of the land that they're saying they're going in really in depth about uh, termination, the, the rivers, and all that. This is what you need to know. Here is the Atlantic Ocean. Then you have the Montserrat River, and that is where Monrovia is situated at. So people know the area that I'm talking about, so it's not confusing and, and people are lost. Okay, so that is where what we're talking about and what they're describing. Okay, opposite to the town are two small islands containing together less than three acres of the ground. Okay. Um, the largest island was built according to the people that lived there, the native style, and it occupied by a family of 700 domestic slaves. So we can assume that this is, I'm not for sure if it's a plantation, we can make that assumption because there are a, a huge chunk of domestic slaves, okay? Formerly the property of an England of an English factor, meaning this was held by an Englishman. It was held in a state of a qualified vassalage. It was it belonged to a black man who had the to whom the right of the original owner had devolved since his return to Europe. So that person went back to Europe, and many of the family members, such as the patriarch, were strangers. They really didn't engage in politics in the region. So. That is what he's describing. I'm giving you a description of what Jehudi Ashman is seeing. So he comes on to Cape Monserrato. This is where it's located. So it's the terrain is not the best. It is situated between two rivers and there are two islands. One is occupied by a black man that used to be owned by the English, which indicated that there is a European presence that is already there. And we know that there are a lot of people on that larger island, domestic slaves that Jehudi Ashman describes. So ethnic groups, based on how he described it, the Day, the Quays, the Guras, and the Kandos. Now, the Kandos are what we refer to as the Poros, uh, uh, Poro societies, Mende, uh, 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 many, many people. Um, and so he describes it as a name that brought terror of all the maritime neighbors. They were much, he describes the Guras as much more numerous and toilsome race of men occupying the country to the northward of the upper parts of the St. Paul River. The Quez, a small and quiet people whose country lies to the east of Cape Maserata, the day inhabited the coast from 25 miles to the northward of Maserata to the mouth of the Junk. Again, this is what Jehudi Ashman is describing. Again, some of these, some of the groups that he's describing, we do not call them today. 
Yeah, we still call the day the day, but the condos, we don't call them the condos anymore. The gurus, we don't call them the gurus anymore. And the quays, we don't call them that anymore. So understand, this is important whenever you're reading something. Understand the context of when this is written and what they are describing. This is what they are describing. It's important to understand that. They spell Kruman, Kruman. We don't spell Kruman like that or even crew anymore, but that's what they pronounce it. They were well known by foreigners visiting the coast as watermen and pies of, of their country, and that was near Cape Palmas. They were described as the most enterprising, intelligent, and laborious people in their part of Africa within the Windward Coast. Um, they were described as being strong, muscular, top quality people. And their settlement was near the mouth of Monserrato. However, their settlements were very different. Their settlements were very small. Oftentimes, they didn't really exceed more than 50 individuals. So they were very small. They were very scattered. They were very scarce with these settlements. But they were very strong and they were very powerful. Okay. And that is what we would know today as Setra Crew. Okay. That's what they, that's what he describes as Setra Crew. We call them the crew people today. Okay. Then we have Dr. Eli Ayers' reports. So he reports two small schooners belonging to the colony that were employed to the transportation of the repatriates in January of 1822. Um, hostilities were going with the day people. And when they arrived, the days didn't take that too kindly. Okay. So this is where John S. Mill comes into play. So John S. Mill is a man who owned the smallest of the two islands on the mouth of the uh, other mouth. Other miles water. He was an African man by birth. He was the son of an English merchant who owned a large trading company on the coast. He enjoyed an elite education. He was employed in Liberia in 1824. He died on July 20th, 1825 from, I'm not sure how to pronounce this, but, um, and then he took great interest in the foundation of Liberia. So we can assume, I'm not for sure, but Based on this, we can assume that John S. Mill is somebody that is mixed race. Based on the account that Jehudi Ashman gives in his journal, we can assume that John S. Mill is mixed race. Okay. So let's talk about the local kings, the indigenous people that, that people oftentimes say that there was this drastic tensions with, okay? So they offered accommodations with the most imposing of appearance of sincerity and reason. An invitation was met to the country's authorities in a friendly conference at King Peter's town. Eli Ayers was detained by King Peter and consented to the conditions that he would reaccept the remnant of goods which he had advanced in the month preceding in part payment for the land. And King George resided on the Cape and claimed jurisdiction of the Northern District of the peninsula of Maserato, and he's going to be important because he's going to be causing a lot of conflicts later going on. Okay. Looting ships in conflicts with the day. So there's a boat that happened. There's a boat that is approaching three miles, and this is on March 27, 1822. So this is in 1822, not in 1821. The land was bought in 1821. And now the settlement is, is going on in 1822, which is why we call it the Bicentennial, because that's where the first major African-American settlement happens. So King George's warriors and King George is going to be a constant problem. He his warriors pass up on. This river and they see the, the, the this boat. So they attack it. So a second boat was then dispatched to overtake to support them. And as the boats were making their way down the river, again, they attacked. They left one repatriate and an Englishman wounded. We can say they killed them. And two other persons were slightly injured, mortally wounded. That means majorly wounded to the borderline of being killed uh, or, or killed. And the tension between the repatriate and the day would continue as the repatriates were opposed to the slave trade. So the slave trade, it was described as a slave trade for the violent, exaggerated declamation by 
nearly all whose interests, fears, prejudice were concerned in their expulsion. Old King Peter, there's a, there, there are two different King Peters. Old King Peter, the patriarch of the nation, was capitulated, impeached, and brought to trial on charge of betraying the interests of his subjects by selling their country. The king had been ruling for more than 30 years. Okay. And then we have Ben Kaye, a neighbor of the Repatches, who was secretly supplying them with fuel and water. Okay. And he's going to play a critical role. Okay. So King Maswain. As I said, King Boswain is a slave trader, and we know this as far back as 1807. But the way that Jehudi Ashman describes him, he is a native of Sherbra or Sherbro. That's how he describes Jehudi. He served in many jobs on the board of an English merchant vessel where he acquired the name and he still retained it. He was one of the most powerful leaders of, of the condos, as he described it. His power was felt by all the people around him. He had strong authority within this region because he brought a lot of fear. I mean, this man was a slave trader. I mean, he's going to bring fear in, in that region. He's, it's not somebody who is to be stepped over. And even his physical appearance is very tremendous it's described that he is over seven feet tall so again king Boswain is not no scrub or somebody to take lightly and again this goes to the point of addressing the indigenous population of liberia that will, will what would become liberia at the time these indigenous people were not people who didn't have weapons that were not waging wars, that didn't have their own political interests. Whether that is King Boswain, it's King Peter, it's John S. Mills, who's playing a critical role. Everybody has their own interest in play. Some of them supported the Repatches, some of them were utterly against the Repatches, such as King George. It ultimately depends on their interests and motivations. And I need people, if nothing else, from this live stream, understand that there are competing interests at play. There's not this black and white, oh, they were all oppressive and the natives just welcomed them with open arms. Some of them welcomed them with open arms, but as Jehudi Ashma describes, there are day people that are tacking ships, taking loot, mortally wounding and injuring people. This is what's going on in the Windward Pepper Coast that we call Liberia at the time, in Cape Montserrado. This is what's going on. So let's continue. It is said that Botswain provided due justice between the coastal people and the Repatriates. He had brought a force sufficient to enact his decisions. Again, these groups were not weak links. Okay, these were not, uh, uh, these indigenous people didn't have five or 10 people as their military. These forces had hundreds and hundreds of men. And as I go on further, you're going to learn that the forces they were able to sum up were huge. Okay. So, by Swain had assembled the head chiefs of the neighborhood, sent the agents of the to come and explain the nature of, of their claims on the country and to set forth their grievances. So the days complain, they complain bad faith of the days in withholding possession of lands which they had sold to the colonists and of the injuries, acts, and hostilities committed by King George, apparently with the consent of his superiors. Again, y'all, King George is going to be a problem. I personally don't like King George. But this is what's going on. This is what they are describing and complaining about. So the bad faith of the days in withholding possessions of land which they had sold to the colonists, and then, of course, the hostilities committed by King George. So King Boswain described, like I said, is described as being seven feet in height, perfectly erect, muscular, and finely portioned. Okay? He is said to have said to the days that having sold their country and accepted the payment in part, they must take the consequences. The refusal of the balance of the purchase money did not annul or affect the bargain. Let the Americans have their land immediately. Whoever's not satisfied with my decision, let them tell me so. 
Again, this is not to treat King Baswain as his major martyr and he was a sweet angel and he was just, no, he's doing what's in his interest again. So King Baswain said to the agents, I promise you protection that these people give you further disturbance, sin for me, and I swear if they oblige, and swear if they oblige to me, if they oblige to me, not oblige, yeah, oblige me to come again to quiet them, I will do it to purpose for taking their heads from their shoulders. As I did old King George's my last visit on the coast to settle disputes. Okay. Again, this is important to understand what is what what is going on. Okay. Oh yeah, I wanted to say thanks for taking the time to put this together. Uh, I, I I do this all the time. I do this all the time. Make sure you're leaving comments. Make sure you're giving your opinion. If you have any questions, let me know in the chat. Um, give me your perspective. Give me your comment. Let me know what you guys think about it. Okay. So let's talk about the government of the United States. Because this is where some more immigrants were captured. Africans are going to come. Now, remember, when Liberia is established, it's not just African Americans going there. It's recaptured Africans. That's the primary means. It's recaptured Africans because a lot of Africans were getting smuggled into the United States even after the importation of Act of 1808 was officially enforced where you could not import African slaves. People were still importing African slaves. Uh, e. Franklin Frazier talked about it. 300,000 to 500,000 came in afterwards. I mean, thousands and thousands of Africans were being were being sold into slavery, brought to the United States. They may not have been under a U.S. flag. They might have been under a French flag. They might have been under a Spanish flag. They might have been under a British flag. They might have been under a Danish flag. But they were still importing thousands and thousands of Africans. So now they have to figure out what to do with these recaptured Africans. And their solution was to deport these recaptured Africans back to the continent. So that is where this is gonna this, this is where it brings up. It says the government of the United States had a number of Africans in the custody of the Marshal of Georgia who had been liberated from a slave vessel by an 1890 law and were sent to Liberia. Again, this is what Liberia was primarily meant to be. What's the dump recaptured Africans? We don't want these recaptured Africans here. We don't also want some of these free African Americans here. So we want to dump them somewhere. We want to send them off to a place where they're as far away from the United States and the United States can be a white nation. I mean, that's talked about by Thomas Jefferson. That's talked about with Patrick Henry back in, 17, in the 1790s. This is their primary objective, okay? So there were 37 persons that were under the supervision of the colonization site on a vessel in Baltimore. That's where these recaptured Africans are, 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 are. On May 26, the ship sailed from Hampton Roads. On June 26, they had stopped at Fayo because there was a severe and protracted gale. The ship then sailed again on July 3rd and arrived in Cape Monserrato on August 8th, which that shows you that was about a three-month journey. And all 55 individuals survived. There was numerous problems. The Apaches weren't sufficiently housed. Public property had been, been consumed by fire. It was peak rainy season that, uh, as Judy has been described, although now we know peak rainy, well, yeah, it is rainy season. Uh, um, houses had to be built before these new immigrants could safely land because you can't just bring these immigrants into Liberia and they don't have nowhere to stay, nowhere. You, you just can't do that. They got to have somewhere to go. They have somewhere to stay. And they had to build a storehouse so that people could transport the goods could be discharged. On the 9th of August, the brig parted a cable and was obliged to throw out the only remaining anchor on board. On August 10th, the cable had again parted and the best bore was gone. The current from the river, unfortunately, was favorable and the vessel got under the sail in time to prevent it from being destroyed. The wind was able to make course parallel to the coast. The 55 passengers were still on board and the people were safely landed on the 13th and the 14th of August. So despite all that, that, that craziness that was going on and issues with the boat, they were able to land them safely on, on Cape Monserrato. Okay. 
And it took four weeks for the passengers and all to be transported on shore. So Repatriates defense. So how did the Patriots use Repatriates defend themselves? Well, at the time, there were only 27 when sick were able to bear arms. So there weren't that many people. They were untrained in their use. There was only 40 muskets in store, one brass and five iron, and there was no fixed ammunition. Okay. Now, Jehudi Ashman described other ways that they tried to defense it, trying to establish the Martello Tower, that we're going to get in further in depth. But that is a situation going on in Cape Monserrato with the Repatriate at the time. There's not that many of them. There's only 50, there's only like 100 of them at max, that 27 of them could bear arms. Because remember, some of them had to go back to the United States. The agents had to go back to the United States and were essentially left to their own. Um, so this idea that these African-Americans just came to Liberia and just started taking land from indigenous people has no fact and has no basis. And again, people need to read primary source because this is a primary source. All the information I'm getting, you can literally read in the book written by Jehudi Ashman. And I'm actually going to do that later on when I have to describe the wars that are going to break out. OK, so. King George abandoned his settlement in the Cape. Here we go again with King George around September 1st. Um, the agent's wife, side note, had died from se September 15th. Two of the immigrants um, from the voyage also had died. And again, it's due to fever because, again, a lot of African immigrants, African American immigrants, and recaptured Africans died of malaria, died of, of tuberculosis. So that was a severe hit on, on, on the colonists that that's going to or the repatriates that's going to affect them later down the line. By November, the agents were debilitated and was nearly capable of moving. He was described as barely being alive and he recovered, but he had to walk with a crutch. OK, so King Brit Peter, Kings Peter in Bristol during the war council. So they had this war council. And here's what King Peter and King Bristol had to say. He said the increased number of the colonists gave them superiority, which would insecure their success, that they were not a settlement of foreigners and enemies, but of their countrymen and friends, as was proved by the identity of their color and therefore had the right to reside in their country and might be expected to turn all civilization, which they had learned abroad, to the improvement of their common country. OK, so this is what King Peter in Bristol said, basically allowed them to be here, allowed them to be here. They're not foreigners. They're not enemies. They're they're common people like us. Let let them be here. That's what King Bristol and Peter are describing. Okay, here's what King George in his counter. I didn't I didn't put that here, but here's where we describe King George. This is what King George is saying. The Americans were strangers who had forgot their attachment to the land of their fathers. For if not, why had they not renounced their conexation with the white man altogether and placed themselves under the protection of the kings of the country? King George had already been under the necessity of removing, of removing from his town and leaving the cape in their hands. This was but the first step of their encroachment. If left alone, they must in very few years master the whole country. And as all other places were full, their own tribe must be without a home and cease any longer to remain a nation. The armed schooners were gone. The two first agents had fled also. The new people could form sickness. Very little assist the old in the defense of the place and have brought with them a valuable cargo of stores which would enrich the conquerors. The white man was sick no doubt would die. And the rest were not much superior to an equal number of themselves and could easily be overcome either by sudden surprise or by wasting and harassing blockade. So that is what King George in his side are saying, the detractors of allowing these African-Americans, these were captured African repatriates, onto the land. And guess whose version comes to fruition. You bet it, y'all. It is King George. So on September 10th, word got out that forces were crossing the Montserrat River a few miles above the settlement. At night, they assembled with six to 900 men. Again, that was based on the Council of the King. It could have been higher. So again, 
where is this idea that these African Americans and these Repatriates just stumped right over these African these, these, these African kings and locals? I, I, I genuinely want to know where this information comes from because these primary sources are saying something completely different. Okay, you have 600, 900 men going up against about 100 African Americans. I remember I said about 25, 27 when sick were able to be armed, maybe a little bit more now, but not many could be armed again. Okay, so this is where I'm going to talk about the actual source. So we're going to the actual source of, of it. And here is actually, so I showed you guys the list of deaths and injuries. Okay. okay. So I do a lot of highlighting. So beware. I do a lot of highlighting. Um, so, again, they are attacking the settlement. We know that Bromley, Toto, Governor, Conco, Jimmy, Gray, and Long Peter, and George, George, and Willie, with their entire force and all of King Peter's warriors and the auxiliaries already named, were in the last week of October, perfectly combined and assembled under arm on Bushwood Island, about four miles from the settlement on the St. Paul River. And the agent, the agent that's working with the African Americans, when this word got out, basically that they're going to attack the settlement, he says he was perfectly appraised of their hostile deliberations, not understanding their pains to conceal them, and that if they proceeded to bring war upon the Americans without even asking to settle their differences in a friendly manner, they would dearly learn what it was to fight white men. Now, they fight white men before, but that's what Jehudi Ashman is saying. Okay. So again, George, he wants. This settlement gone. Okay. So on the 7th of November, intelligence received that the last measures were being prepared to assault the settlement. And the agent has stated that this is what he described. He described war was now inevitable and that the provisions of their property, their settlement, their families, their lives depended on God, wholly under their own firmness and good conduct that a most important uh, point in the defense of the place was to secure a perfect uniformity of action which should assure to every post and individual the firm support of every other. To this end, they must punctuously obey their officers as if their whole duty was centered, as it probably was in that one point. Okay? So that is what... is being described as these African Americans are about to attack the settlements. Okay. So they are going to attack the settlement. It's not a matter of if they're going to attack the settlement, they're going to attack the settlements. Okay. So what does that mean for these African Americans and these recaptured Africans? And I keep bringing up the two because African Americans and recaptured Africans are not the same. Recaptured Africans are Africans who have been taken from Africa and they were about to be sold into slavery, but they didn't get sold into slavery. They got stuck on the ship. They got sent back to Africa. Okay? African Americans have been there sometime for two, three generations. Okay, so their ancestors weren't born in, in Africa. Okay, so again, he they have to prepare defenses. So they they have to do the Martella Tower. They have to get muskets prepared. They have to fortify the the settlement because again. Where the settlement is at, it is very vulnerable. It is very vulnerable. So you have to start mortifying it. So what they were doing was they were preparing ammunition. They were closing off any areas that were vulnerable such that so that King George and his forces they could not exploit those weaknesses, move into those areas, cross the river, and then get to the cave. Because you could get to the settlement by just crossing over the river. And it's not a long river. It's a very shallow river. Okay, This is not like you about to cross the Ohio River and you finna cross the Mississippi River. You're going to cross a river that is very short, very narrow. Okay, So you got to fortify that. Okay, 
And like I said, because it's a peninsula, because it's a peninsula, you got to fortify deep. Because you're surrounded in all three, you're surrounded in three areas. They can come through the river, they can come from the north, they can come from the south. So you got to fortify all that. Okay. So I want to describe to you guys what happened. Because we don't talk about that. Again, all of this stuff is glossed over. The details of what happened get completely glossed over when we talk about what was going on. So let me tell y'all through the description of what Jehudi Ashman describes. Okay, you ready? Okay. Here is what is described during this war. This short, it wasn't really a major war. It was really a skirmish. I mean, it wasn't that brutal. It was, it, lives were lost. I'm not going to degrade and then negate that, but it, it's, it wasn't like a wholly major war. Here's what it's described. It says right here, The native force was already in motion and followed directly in the rear of the picket guard. The latter had just rejoined their gun, about which 10 men were now assembled. When the enemy suddenly presenting a front 10 yards in width at 60 distance delivered their fire and rushed forward with their spears to seize post. Several men were killed and disabled by the first fire and the remaining driven from their gun without discharging it. Then retiring upon the center, threw the reserve their station into momentary confusion and had the enemy at this instant pressed their advantage, it is hardly conceivable that they should have failed of entire success. The avidity for plunder was their defeat. Four houses in that outskirts of the settlement had fallen into their hands. Every man whose savage rapacity so resistless a temptation had happened to operate rushed impetuously upon the pillage thus thrown in his way. The movement of the main body was disordered and impeded. Okay. And an opportunity afforded the agents assisted principally by the Reverend Lot Carey to rally broken forces of the settlers, the two central guns with a part of their own men and several who had been driven from the Western station were with little exertion brought back into action. So this is what is going on. So they're attacking, they're taking houses. We have reports that Women and children are in the are in these areas, in, in these houses, and we're gonna learn about that later. Uh what happens to some of these women? Okay, people are being mortally wounded. Then you have a few musketeers with E. Johnson, that is being Elijah Johnson, one of a war veteran of the of the war of 1812, at their head by passing round upon the enemy's flank, served to increase the consternation which was beginning to pervade their unwieldy body. Now, quick side note on Elijah Johnson. Elijah Johnson is really what saves Liberia and what allows Liberia to be what it is. Elijah Johnson is by far one of the greatest Liberian founders and everybody who is Liberian, African-American needs to know who he was. He was a war veteran in 18, in, in 1812. He was the one responsible when the agents had left the United States and he had was responsible for taking care of the immigrants in the settlement. He's the one that is fighting this conflict right now when King George and his forces start attacking this settlement. He's going to be the one that's going to go when the Port Passant massacre happens a decade later. Uh, when, when 20 or more African Americans are massacred, are massacred by King Joe of the Basa people. And he sends troops down there. He's going to be the one that's going to be signing the Declaration of Independence. He's going to be the one that's going to birth, whose wife is going to birth another president in Hillary R.W. Johnson. So Elijah Johnson is playing the most pivotal role in this country. And it's important that all of y'all understand that who Elijah Johnson is, the role that he plays. Elijah Johnson is the reason. 
is the major reason why Liberia is still there today. Okay, so it's important that people understand who Elijah Johnson is. Okay, so people are not unaware of his significance. He is he's very significant. Okay. So Elijah Johnson is doing his thing. He's defending the settlements. And so we have the enemy. They're recoiling. They're still attacking. And then you have the very violence employed by those in front and their impatience to hasten it by increasing confusion produced and affect opposite to that intended. The Americans perceiving their men now regained possession of the Western Post and instantly brought the long night to rake the whole line of the enemy. So they were able to keep them at bay. They were able to prevent them from advancing any further. And so now they are like, okay, we can we can sort of fight this now. So it, he later described that there's 800 men that were pressed shoulder to shoulder in, in a compact form. So they were together, okay? And it said every shot literally spent its force in a solid mass of living human flesh. The fire suddenly terminated. Okay. And he was a savage yell was waged, which filled the dismal force with momentary horror. And then it slowly, it slowly started to, to die away as the, the, the forces, King George's forces, started to go away. At eight o'clock, the most one on signal of their dispersion had returned to their homes was sounded in so many small parties seen at a distance directly afterwards moving off in different directions, okay? Now, this is not the only attack, okay? There's going to be, they're going to try to do it again and again, okay? So it's important to remember that, okay? So it says one woman, so we know this. It says several men were killed. Some had considerable energy injuries. One woman had been imprudently passed a night in the house, first beset by the enemy, had received 13 wounds, and had been thrown aside as dead. Another flying from her house with her two infants, children, received a wound in the head from a cutlass and was robbed of both of her babies. So remember, they're going to take some of these African-Americans hostage. Some of these African-American women and children, especially the children, are going to be held hostage. They're going to be taken by King George and his forces, and they're going to be held hostage. Some of them get back. Some, we don't know what happened to them. But we do know that Native, that African-American and recaptured Africans, young children were being kidnapped, okay? And they were taken hostage. Some were brought back. Some were never seen again. We don't know what happened to them. Stephen Allen Benson, the second president of Liberia, this happened to him when he came to Liberia. He was kidnapped. Eventually he was freed, but he was kidnapped and he was taken there for years. So it's important to understand that aspect of it as well, okay? So let's go on. A young married woman with the mother of five small children Finding the house in which they slept surrounded by savage enemies, barricaded the door and in vain hope for slavery. It was forced. Each of the women, then seizing an axe, held the ir ir irresolute barbarians in check with several minutes longer. Having discharged their guns, they seemed desirous of gaining shelter of the house previous to reloading. Okay. At length, with aid of their spears and by means of general rush, they overcame their heroine's adversary, and instantly stabbed the youngest to the heart. The youngest, the mother, instinctively springing her suckling baby, which recoiled through fright and was left behind, rushed through a small window on the opposite side of the house and providentially escaped to the front, to the lines, unhurt between two heavy fires. Okay? And he makes a note of who these people are. It is Mary Ann Hawkins, who after long and incredible suffering, recovered and is yet living. Mrs. Minty Draper, which we can assume is related to Sarah Draper, who is the lady, one of the ladies who helped design the Liberian flag with Susanna Lewis and her committee. And we have Miss Mary Tom. 
Okay. So that, that's what's going on, fam. That is what's, what is being described as these African-Americans are in this fight going on. Let's, let's continue further. Okay. They were able to disperse this. They were able to disperse this. They were able to end this, this occasion. This for now. But then, in the Colonial Journal, November 15th, the following circumstances prove the carnage had been for a number engaged great. A large canoe from which the dead and wounded could be seen to be taken on its arriving at the opposite side of Montserrado, and which might easily 12 men were employed upwards of two hours in ferrying them over. Okay. It is known that many of the wounded were conveyed away along the South Beach on mats, and that the dead left of necessity in the woods where many fell or are carried off by their friends every night. Okay. Every night. Okay. So this is what's going on. And let me let me add even more insult to injury to the craziness that is happening. Okay. Okay. Let me I should have put that full screen so people can see. Um let me know if y'all can see. Does that no, that might be too that might be too that's too small. Yeah, that, that doesn't work. I thought it would work. Okay. So it says I thought it would work, but it didn't work. It says, but two days ago, 72 bodies were discovered by a party of friendly condos employed by the agents for the purpose. On entering the wood, the offensive effluvium from putrid bodies is at this time intolerable. The numerical falls amounted to 35 persons, including six native youth, not 16 years of age. Of this number, about one half were engaged. Okay. And they list the people that were mortally wounded or died. And here's what they describe. Joseph Benson shot dead in the beginning of the action. So again, this debunks the myth, like I said before, and I put that in my in my exploring and re-examining Liberian history that got into the Liberian Observer. People treat the native population that they just had spears, that they were primitive, that they didn't have weapons. These native people had guns. They had muskets, okay? We're describing somebody who was shot dead. So that means they have guns. They have firearms. They have the power to fight toe-to-toe -to -toe with these African-Americans. Again, if it wasn't for some of the allies, recaptured Africans, African-Americans, that settlement would not exist. Elijah Johnson, that settlement doesn't exist. Liberia doesn't exist. And this stuff is never talked about. If it wasn't for those African Americans, recaptured Africans, allies, indigenous allies, that settlement would have got crushed. Mary Tyne stabbed to death in her house. Thomas Spin mortally injured by five wounds. Billy, a native African, mortally wounded. Anne Hawkins. Desperately injured by 13 moon. Daniel Hawkins severely DO through the thigh. James Benson very severely injured because they injured through the shoulder. Mintley, Minty Draper slightly injured in the face and ear. Two small children of Minty Draper missing. Five, oldest 13, James Benson. 15 whole numbers of sufferers. All movable effects of five families had fallen into enemies' hands. Okay. So, after that happens, after all this craziness happens, it's going to happen again. Again, there are there so many conflicts that happen. It, it was described that Tom Bassa, a prince of some distinction, should at this moment have sent a message to ensure the colony of his friendship. Okay. And the testimony of his sincerity have forwarded a small present of production of the country. Okay. 
Now, the previous paragraph talks about the fortification, the artillery, the gun, and guns that they had burying the dead, the aftermath of all that. That's what that paragraph is talking about. And they and it was complete on Sunday morning, the seventeenth, when they had service, had the privilege of selling divine service, a privilege many of them appreciated. So that it was, we can basically say that uh, it was church service. Seven infant children were in the hands of the enemy, infuriated by his recent losses. The native forces were certainly not dispersed. Um, it was no longer in the, in the agent's power to learn about the intentions, and at. I mean, it is what it is at that point. Then to try to see if they can go again. They're going to go send a message to the Council of Native Chiefs who were engaged in debating the question of renewing hostilities at King Peter's Town. The Americans came with friendly intentions, have evinced those friendly intentions in all their intercourse with people of this country. Why have you then brought war on us without any complaint of injury? We are willing to settle a peace, but we're also prepared to carry on on the war and can render it immensely more bloody and destructive than you felt it before. The message left the settlement at six o'clock and at daylight the next morning, an answer was received that having bought the low land of Bush while the Americans had seized upon Cape Mount without right, the country people visiting the settlement had been cheated and roughly used by the storekeeper that the agents had not fulfilled their promise of instructing the people, but they would gladly make peace if satisfaction were offered for these injuries. Okay. Now, you know, now you know there wasn't for a lot of that to happen, right? You know there wasn't for a lot. So, this time they're going to do it again. And they're going to have stronger reinforcement that's happening. Okay? So, they were to renew the attack the 11th at daylight on the following morning. So, they ain't stopping. Okay? So, they're making preparations again to fight the African-Americans again because they just want to fight them, okay? And so they have another skirmish again and they're able to beat that feud. Again, it goes into detail of what it's described. Um, assailants being repulsed, people getting hit, bodies dropping, the muskets, the Martell's tower. That is what's being described in, in all of what's going on. Cannonade, all the assailants being attacked. Um, Gardner, Cook, Crook, and Times were badly, the last one mortally wounded. So we know a couple more African Americans died before all this hostilities ended. And the settlement is able to basically go back in line. So then an English schooner, uh, the Prince Regent, laden with military stores led by Captain Lang of the Royal African Light Infantry. And he has a prize crew commanded by Gordon belonging to HBM, super board driver, six days from Sierra Leone, bound for the Cape Coast. And on there was also a crew man, uh, a crew man, we should say a crew woman. It was a crew woman. They described him as crew man, but it's really a crew woman. And she was bored and she gave the intelligence of the situation of the settlement and that they were basically saying that the schooner would provide them any assistance if necessary. And as I said, they're going to keep it going. So, eight out of the 11 generous seamen are going to die. And another skirmish, because again, skirmishes keep going on. Okay, I just need this to be known. Okay, it wasn't like the, the, the skirmishes weren't happening, they, they kept happening, they kept happening, and they kept happening, and happening, and happening. Okay, okay, so hostilities finally end again, and we should, we should be good. So, two of the children. Were then take were then given back through a small gratuity. Five of them were still at hand, and they were 
going to be released if there was a very extravagant ransom. Okay. And then, of course, more people are going to come in. It's reported that 66 additional immigrants were going to come again. And the middle states of America, we when they say middle states of America here, they're usually saying Virginia, Maryland, North Carolina, that area. Um, so just be aware when they say middle America, they're not being like the middle of the United States. They mean like the 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 what we call them like what used to be known as the middle colonies, Virginia, Maryland, that that, that region. So just be aware. And then of course they have doctors like Dr. Dix. He's going to die. Uh, he's a surgeon and. That is what happens. So yeah, that's the founding of Liberia, the early history, according to the journal Jehudi Ashmoon, who was a religious leader, somebody who was instrumental in, in, in the life in the development of Liberia, who was the boots on the ground. Let me know what you guys think. Ask me any questions. What did you think about this? What would you guys like to be? What would you guys like me to discuss later on? Let me know what you guys think. That's all I have for the, the founding of, of Liberia. I will say this. Reading this stuff really opened my eyes. Again, this is why you got to read primary sources because reading these primary sources really opened my eyes. It, 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 it really opens a new layer of understanding of Liberia's history and the, the situation that's happening on West Africa and in the Windward Coast. When you read the Merchant's, Gu uh, Merchant's Guide, um, it was referring to uh, from from Cape Palmas to and, and, and to, to the Grand Cape Mount. They, they have a merchant's guide that, that you can also get as well. That was written around that time. When you got sketches written by John Adams, not the president John Adams, but the, the merchant during this time as well, in 1822, 1823, when he does these sketches and he's describing the situation that's happening. When you have the observations that were describing King Boswain in 1807, that's very important. When you have the Liverpool... When you have the Liverpool situation in 1799, um, addressing that situation that you can also get, it was br brought up in the House, uh, in, in, in the British Parliament. That is information that's key. That is information that's important. That really gets you in tune with what was going on, the mindset that was happening. And I suggest everybody read it. Also read the African Repository and Colonial Journal. That is a huge resource that also goes in depth with it as well. Read Daniel Coker's journal. He does a lot of information. La Carie's journal, it brings a lot of information. So it's so important. Will you be filming your journey in Liberia? I'm planning to film my journey in Liberia because I want to bring more uh, awareness to it. So I definitely will be um, planning to film my journey in, in Liberia when I go over there next year. I'm really excited. I've been waiting for five years since 2018 to go to Liberia since I was a senior in high school and and now I'm get to finally do it on my own terms and I can't wait for that so I can't wait to film that will you be meeting Congo descendants I don't know a lot of Congo descendants so I really won't be able to um I just know a lot of Liberians of different ethnicities. I know Grebos. I know crew. I know Mono. I, I know Basa. But in terms of Congo descendants, I really, I, I really don't know too much Congo descendants in Liberia. I hope if, if I can, I, I, I will um, meet up with them. So I'm looking forward to that as well. Um, I really wish I could have been there this year because this is a very special year. I just wish we just continue the bicentennial. I know the bicentennial is 200 years and the math is 2022. Um, in 1822, that's 200 years. I just hope that in 2047, it's a lot better. We need to start preparing for that. We need to start preparing for 2047. So when 200 years of when the Declaration of Independence is signed, it can be lit and uh, African-Americans can be celebrating uh, Liberia in 2047, in Monrovia, in Grand Gita, in River Cess, in Maryland County. So, you know, I wish I could have been there this year because this year has so much meaning, but I'm still going to get there next year. And then let's 
shoot for Liberia 247 and make things happen. So with that, if there are no more questions, again, make sure you like, share, and subscribe. Please, if you are still in the chat, please sign up to the website at blafricstandard.org. Register. We are trying to get as many people to sign up so we can begin our mission in the starting initiatives in Liberia all throughout the country. We really would appreciate if y'all would sign up, show us your strengths. So if you are somebody in STEM, somebody who d does well in political science, you can start outlining public policy. If you're in STEM, you can start outlining um, uh, infrastructure projects, roads, chemical, chemical infrastructure, we need biological infrastructure, all of that stuff needs to be there. So please sign up to that website if you can. Please, please do, and we really appreciate it. With that, y'all, I will see y'all again in the next video. We do have a live stream coming up this Sunday. Thank you guys for the people that tuned in, and I will see you guys again in the next video. Also, follow me on TikTok at Change Liberia Narrative. If you want to uh, see my TikToks, because I do a lot of TikTok videos about Liberia on it on TikTok with my Change Liberia narrative. So make sure you do that and peace MC, peace to everybody in the fam. Love you guys, like, share, and subscribe.